Wow. Ha, hey, Internet. Welcome to Worldview Everlasting, where you can see your favorite YouTube addiction is more or less in utter and total chaos. Ha, but we're still going to answer questions today for you. Righto. So here we are. And yeah, my house is getting crazy. I mean, we got boxes everywhere and it seems the more stuff I put into boxes, the more stuff is on the floor and on all the furniture and the tables. I thought it would get cleaner and it's going the other way, but uh, we're getting real close. Move out for us is going to be a week from today, next Friday, but I'm going to do my best to get a video out on that day anyway, by doing it the day before one dropping it in the morning for you. So, but just a heads up then. So for the next couple of weeks, there are going to be no Greek Tuesdays because it's just just a little too much going on and after we move out there's going to be at least a week down total for no worldview everlasting podcast but that doesn't mean that we don't got answers to you got all those questions keep checking worldvieweverlasting.com where the we team will be providing regular daily updates and answers to the questions you write in because you want to know what you believe why you believe it thanks mike horton for that excellent line we cool with that all right i hope so <laughs> that's the way it's gonna be and if you haven't yet seen or heard or been invited to the installation I get to participate in at my new congregation in Chicago land ish area Naperville, Illinois on November 20th at 4 p.m. 4 p.m. 4 p.m. That's right Please consider this an open invitation if you're in the area or a couple hours away and feel like coming out for a good time Issues etc's very own Todd Wilkin will be doing the preaching to my extreme honor And it should be just kind of an all-around uh, happening, hymn singing, rip-roaring sacramental fest. Yo, yo. So consider yourself invited, even if you live in Siberia. Ow. Oh, and we're working on also having a live stream, which may indeed happen. I think we're going to pull that off as well, thanks to some of your requests. And when we live stream, we should also be recording it if we can. The trick will be the camera that we're using. But anyway, if we do get it recorded, it'll also be posted on this very own YouTube site for your viewing pleasure. Right on. Okay, so. Where are we today? Email. Questions on the Lord's Supper. Here we go. Greetings. I have heard of pastors who withhold communion from those they perceive may be unworthy or may lack discernment. True, one who partakes unworthily brings damnation on himself. I think we should insert the word but here. But I think the pastor should teach, not discern who is worthy. Only God can examine the heart of man. 1 Corinthians 11, 8 says, Let a man examine himself. By denying someone communion, aren't you in a way damning them? Or at the very least, raising doubt. Thanks, R. Wow, there's a lot of stuff going on there, but this is actually really perceptive of you. That last statement, the practice of closed communion as it has been practiced in Christianity from the beginning, and as only, well, liberals have ever gotten rid of it over time in various traditions, the entire real purpose of it is to call into doubt the question of the one who is being denied the communion in order to make them aware of a very real and present error that they are refusing to admit is there. Now this should not in any way be a sin of the heart. No, no, no. And if that's the case, if this is just pastors running amok saying, well, I'm not so sure he's a real believer because, you know, he doesn't sing loud enough or something like that. Well, uh, yeah, not exactly the way to go. But, okay, so in order to kind of get a handle on this, one of the first things you have to recognize is that your question and your quote of that Bible passage is by itself apart from context is coming from a worldview, a philosophy that is heavily undergirded by the enlightenment or rationalism or the triumph of the individual. As if it's this biblical idea, which it's not, that really life is all about individual people and we are kind of islands unto ourselves. It's me and God, and then the rest of you kind of, well, hopefully it's you and God too, but uh, ultimately spirituality is about me. This is a very foreign concept to the Bible, and it really is foreign even to Western civilization until this enlightenment, triumph of the individual, reversal of fit thing. What's the reversal of fit? Cool concept, and I forget the philosopher who proposed this, but the idea is that before the enlightenment, the general question that every Western person asked was, how do I fit into the narrative, the history of the Bible's world? How do I find a place that I become part of that story which is real that the Bible tells. Post-enlightenment, fit got reversed and it became how does the Bible fit into the story of me? 
right? Right. I think you can see that without any question. So when you quote 1 Corinthians 11, 28 and say, let a man examine himself, and you put that like in capitals to kind of prove that it's all about him, well, you're ignoring the entire book of 1 Corinthians that's all about how the church is a body with many members that must work together and that communion itself and the practice of it itself is not just me communing with God, but it's us communing with each other so that if a person is, say, getting drunk yet not letting other people have any, or coming to the table and saying, ah, this ain't Jesus, people, what are you thinking? They're actually destroying that body. They're doing damage to the church. And we're going to come back to that, but the chief job and duty of the pastoral office is to be a watchman, a shepherd, defending the church from wolves who would do damage to it. I mean, what does the shepherd do? Just teach. Very reformed point of view. Oh, we'll come back to that too. Let's read the whole at least pericope here, right? Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup or anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and some of you have died. But if we, <laughs> notice the plural, judged ourselves, truly we would not be judged. So the idea there as far as judging yourself is concerned is that the community in total should be in the practice of together individually discerning that the body of Christ is present on that altar as bread and blood is there as wine as Jesus promised for the forgiveness of you but also for the binding together of each other in reconciliation and into the new Adam Jesus himself uh, that we are really one and the body of Christ literally as we partake of it called fellowship yo so it's not really just about you discerning yourself okay now let's bring this back then to closed communion and how this is really practiced when the person comes and presents themselves to the Lord's Supper in order to commune if they come up saying, I think adultery is awesome and that is no way the blood of Jesus. The pastor is going to say, you are an unworthy communicant. Why? Because he's judging the heart? Ha! Hardly. He's judging the confession and the life. And this is where closed communion really comes down. The pastor's job is by no means to try to weed out the secret hidden things of a man's mind. And so yeah, Paul does want you to be kind of aware. You do need to discern for yourself, do I believe this? Am I sitting here kind of scoffing at this? I mean, that, that should cause me a little bit of fear. But the pastor's task nonetheless is to be the gatekeeper, the shepherd. Shepherd, and really, pastor means shepherd, and so run that through what a shepherd actually does for sheep. He doesn't teach the sheep. He leads, guides, protects, and sometimes crooks the sheep. The pastor is to, in fact, well, guard the table. It's his job. It's always been his job from the start. And if you want it not to be his job, you really need to find more than a passage that just quotes the word himself. You need something that talks about the office of the ministry being less than that. But there's nothing which does do that. All the texts that do talk about the office of the ministry or the apostolic office, when you get into them, very much give the pastor Pastor, well, um, real ultimate power. Now, it's not the power of the sword, it's the power of the word, but that word can, in fact, be you are submitting to false teaching and so either need to join those false teachers and leave here or repent and join us because that's always the preferred option. Or, you know, your life is publicly manifesting itself in sin. Are you sorry for this at all? I mean, wouldn't would you like some help stopping? You know, I, I'll come alongside you, help build you up and, and give you the forgiveness you need, but not if you're going to say you don't need forgiveness because, you know, your, um, your greedy, penny-pinching, stealing, thieving, rotten lifestyle is you're just fine with that. Well, that's a problem. And that's not judging the heart. Don't get me wrong. It ain't judging the heart. It's judging the life and the confession. This is where then close communion between bodies, you know, why the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod will not have fellowship with, say, the United Methodist Church is because by attending or being a Methodist, you are publicly confessing that you don't believe the Lord's Supper is what the texts of Scripture pretty clearly say the Lord's Supper is. Not that there aren't Methodists who do believe that. Ironically, they are, but they don't have a problem being in fellowship with those who don't and teach otherwise. We have a bit of a problem with that. It's one of the six chief parts of our faith. And if you're going to say it's not that big a deal. You know, a major in the majors and minor in the minors, only you're minoring in, well, what's a major? Well, we're going to say, yeah, we should call into question your commitment to salvation. <laughs> uh, you know, we should call into question what you believe and, and make you doubt a little bit. Yeah, you're, you're, well, at the very least, not hearing these words from Romans chapter 16. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So if you're one of those naive, being deceived by the smooth-talking, flattering, not serving Jesus at all people, wouldn't you want to be warned about that? If I just kind of pat you on the head and let you up to communion and don't tell you anything, I mean, am, I, am I loving you? Am I doing you any favor? Am I building your faith? No, I'm confirming you in your error. The practice of closed communion exists so not to confirm you in your error, but to call you to true discernment and a worthy, repentant, doctrinally sound, six chief part, catechetical, even a five-year-old can know it, reception of the supper. Yo, it's a hard teaching, it's a hard topic, uh, and certainly if you don't have a theology of the supper that has it be what Lutherans say it is, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, if it's just bread and wine, it makes no sense at all to see that the church has never really believed that, and those who teach that are just out on a limb by themselves.
themselves so far as Christian history and really actually the majority of Christians in the world today as well. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of these things, number two. I am not a heart judger. <laughs> Email. In your April 23 answer to the question about Holy Communion, you mentioned the difference between the Reformed view and the Lutheran view, and ultimately being about the difference in Christology. Would you please elaborate on the relationship between the Lutheran Biblical view of the Lord's Supper and Lutheran Biblical Christology? Awesome question and awesome teaching. And for me, one of the ones that really did kind of confirm just how big an error even like a, a pretty decent Reformed Calvinist view of the Supper ultimately ends up being. And it comes down to something historically called the Council of Chalcedon, which is one of the original seven was it eight ecumenical councils? The councils where everybody, all Christians everywhere, sent bishops to participate in. And they weren't like sectarian or corner councils. They were big ones. We got the Nicene Creed from one of these councils. Well, the Chalcedonian Council was wrestling with teachers who were teaching that Jesus was less than he really is. More or less that he either wasn't God or was so much God that he wasn't man. And this was causing a lot of distress in the early church. I mean, our Christianity today, even pure Protestant Christianity on the surface, would get really bothered if I came up and said, no, Jesus isn't God, right? That would bother even like the most oneness Pentecostalish Pentecostal, who's not a Trinitarian and, and therefore isn't really a Christian. But they'd still be bothered by that statement, right? And we owe this in our history, in our kind of DNA, to the Council of Chalcedon. However, the nitty-gritty of it has very much been rejected, maybe not so much on the surface, but in practice, especially when it comes to the Lord's Supper and Jesus' ability to handle the material world, things like that. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Around the Council of Chalcedon, there were these two pastors who were fighting against each other, writing letters, teaching contrarily to each other, and causing a big ruckus in the entire Christian world as it existed in, in the Mediterranean that day. One of them was named Nestorius and one of them was named Eutychus. Nestorius taught that Jesus' incarnation, while it happened, his humanity didn't really fully get joined to his divinity. It was joined the way that if you took two boards and glued them together, that's how it was joined. So you could kind of see Jesus, but, but the man Jesus you see, he really wasn't God. God Jesus was kind of with him, but, but there was no actual unity of the person and there certainly was no unity of the attributes. So for example, when Jesus does the miracles, it's not Jesus the man doing the miracles at all, but the Son of God who's somewhere like behind but separate from Jesus, but there he's doing the miracles but not through the human body, right? The human body doesn't have the ability to do those things and, and doesn't receive the benefits of the divinity in the incarnation. Hopefully you can see right off the bat, I mean this is a denial of the incarnation. All right. On the flip side, Eutychus taught that the incarnation was so complete, so total, that the humanity of Jesus amounted effectively to a drop of water let go of into the Pacific Ocean, so that it just kind of vanished in the divinity. So there was so much divinity that, in a sense, the humanity itself was also entirely lost. Jesus isn't really man at all, he's just kind of entirely God. And the humanity is there, but there really isn't, and it's kind of gone. It got absorbed, so to speak. Well, the Council of Chalcedon, after a great deal of debate and the searching of scriptures and the reading of the Church Fathers, kind of comes to the conclusion that this is a nasty, nasty bit of error on both sides. And it comes out of the council condemning both teachings, and therefore both men who insisted on teaching it, with what's called the four negations of Chalcedon. These negations state that the humanity and the divinity of Jesus the Christ, the incarnate Word of God, eternal Son of the Father, born of a Virgin Mary, are to be understood to be without mixture and without confusion. That's condemning Eutychian, that his human nature disappeared entirely and just got confused or mixed with the divine. But also also without separation and without division. That is that you can't actually see between the two. You can only see the person of Jesus who is both of these things, God and man. As a result of this also comes forth the confession that whenever Jesus, the man, the person does anything, even things that one nature according to its own nature can't do, by the communication of the attributes of those two natures, the entire person who is both natures does it. So on the one hand, Jesus, the man, walks on water, which men can can't do usually. I mean, no, we just can't. It's impossible. And on the other hand, Jesus the God dies, which God can't do usually. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's impossible, right? So by the communication of the attributes, the incarnation is able to do pretty significantly amazing things, uh, especially for your salvation, yo. And you can see right there how this would get to the core, the crux of salvation issues itself. I mean, if God can't die, then how does Jesus die on the cross? And if man can't say rise from the dead, well, then how does he rise from the dead? right? All the communication of the attributes. That's how. Get this, Jesus' resurrection wasn't just God the Father raising him alone the way that Jesus raised Lazarus. I mean, well, and then Lazarus' resurrection wasn't just
just Jesus the God raising Lazarus, it was Jesus the man raising Lazarus. And so, whoa, you can see how it gets real deep real fast. But these four negations become very important for understanding how the mystery of the incarnation works. And it negates both mathematical answers, which would take one side or the other to its extreme and holds them in tension together. Now, they're mixing, nor confusing, nor dividing, nor separating. Now, when you get to later issues with the Reformed and Calvin talking about why the Lord's Supper can't be Jesus' body and blood, the classic term that is their term, which they use to define this, this scholastic idea is finitum non capex infinitum, or the finite cannot contain the infinite. That something like material, which is finite, can't possibly hold all of an infinite thing like the divine. Now, I don't think that Calvinism usually uses this phrase to talk about Christology too often, but they certainly do use this to talk about the Lord's Supper, where as bread, the finite cannot contain the infinite risen Jesus, who in almost Eutychian way uh, is totally God and everywhere and yet as a man chained up in heaven so he can't go anywhere else because his body, you know, is human. You know, he can't actually get any benefits from being God. Now, this should really be bothersome. I mean, this is a Nestorianism. The two boards are glued together and God can't actually get into the man because he's just a man. Yeah, it's a crass way of describing it, but it's basically what the teaching is. That's why you have to then, as a Calvinist, ascend in faith to feast on Christ in faith spiritually in heaven, but not actually orally receiving him through the mouth into the belly as bread and wine for your justification by faith alone. Whoa. <laughs> see? And here you can see, and this is where these, these negations of counsel done become very helpful in describing the orthodox way of understanding the Lord's Supper. Although the Lord's Supper is not the incarnation, it's a sacramental union. It's a little bit different in a mysterious way. When Lutherans talk about bread being the body and the wine being the blood of Christ, we neither mix the substances of the two nor confuse them, yet neither do we divide them nor separate them. Yeah. So the bread by the nature of being bread is not Jesus or God, and yet by the sacramental union, it receives the benefits of being Jesus and God for you. Now, there's kind of a limit here on this. The church has never applied those negations, you know, uniformly to the Lord's Supper, but it can give you kind of a hint into the Christology of the teaching behind what you teach about the Lord's Supper. Does Jesus have the ability as man to make use of his divine attributes millions of places throughout time and space all the time in bread and wine to give you the benefits of his risen body and unite himself to you as a vine is to the branch or not yeah is he actually not quite god like he is god but he's stuck in heaven and he can't leave mm. in which case you're an historian and so this is just it because of their lord's supper teaching which then impacts their christology calvinism is a modern form of nestorianism which doesn't mean they're all going to hell it just means that they're wrong now is this the final end-all be-all argument to convince you that the lutheran view of the lord's supper is right no actually the words of jesus should do this he said it this is my body saint paul is pretty clear this is a participation in the actual body and blood of christ not some spiritual juju thing but a real unity. As St. John said, if you do not eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, there's there's no life in you, right? I mean, if you would reject this teaching, you are rejecting Christ. And this should be coming then as a warning to those who do, you know, you know, flee from those who by wily tricksiness would teach otherwise. <coughs> All right, hope I did a good job with that. Uh, we're running out of time, and uh, yeah. But you can kind of see, I mean, you know, all theology is Christology in one sense. That's why Lutherans are so kind of big on, on actually talking theology and, and sharing it, is because we recognize that there's no minors. Like, they, they really do ultimately, if it is doctrine, if it is in Scripture, it ultimately hits Jesus one way or the other, and Jesus is all about God's will in good mercy for you. And so we don't want to lose that. And we like to have Jesus preached as risen from the dead and coming again. And we don't want anything to get in the way of that awesome and amazing saving power of God gospel. Yo, yo. Yo, yo. Ha.